good morning and welcome to this live session uh, this live session comes to you as a part of the nptel course on intellectual property and this is uh, feroz professor feroz from iit madras and i have with me my teaching assistant mr roshan john uh, with whom you have have been communicating on the forum now we have a couple of questions that have come up uh, which you can see on the screen right now it's an excel sheet where we have just populated the questions and we can also see some of you uh, posting some questions on the chat box so uh, uh, so if you have any uh, questions uh, ideally the questions should be with regard to the topics that we have covered so far in the last 5 weeks so any question covering that it will be easier for us to answer that and also you can because this is a, a the the people who take this course are quite heterogeneous you could also add topics which you think needs some emphasis the nature of intellectual property is such that the topics generally cover a wide array of things i mean we have everything from mass media to technological inventions to seeds plant varieties we cover um, we, we cover designs we cover brands marketing logos the uh, so if you look at the span or the scope of intellectual property rights there's quite a lot to cover so the what we are trying to achieve in this course is to give you an introduction to the basic concepts and to direct you to further material so that you can build on what you have learned but there could be instances where you need a special focus or a special discussion on a particular topic for instance you will find that somebody had asked us to cover uh, an issue with a recent acquisition of monsanto by bayer so the, so this has come from a, a student from an agriculture and food engineering department in iit karakpur so special request is something which we can always factor we can answer them in another live session if it is not directly important for us to cover it in the course so we could we could actually increase the number of live sessions that we have based on the requests that come from you so i have a list of questions here what you can see on your screen and i would like to take them one by one uh, some of them may require a detailed answer and some of them could be covered in the forthcoming sessions so uh, the first question is which type of intellectual uh, there's some correction there intellectual property right need in in uh, telecommunications industry or rather uh, to rephrase the question uh, what are the types of intellectual property rights that are relevant for the telecommunications industry now when we talk about the telecommunications industry we can talk about uh, probably uh, the, the easiest way for us to link to is the communication telecommunication industry where we uh, where there are service providers uh, like uh, airtel or um, Uh, or uh, bsnl or uh, aircel or um, uh, uh, or reliance for that matter and this is probably what we can call the telecommunication industry now these are the service providers and there is a whole lot of other stakeholders in this industry for instance uh, you have uh, chip manufacturers you have standard uh, organizations which develop uh, standard essential patents seps as they are called for short and and you have handset manufacturers you have a whole lot of people behind this but for us it is easier for us to say that the telecommunication industry largely pertains to uh, mobile telecom uh, telecom players like uh, like the service providers so the most relevant right here apart from the fact that all these players have their own brands and their own brands are marketed uh, using uh, particular logos say qualcom or uh, ericsson or nokia motorola uh, and and some of the handset manufacturers like huawei then um, then uh, apple iphone uh, the, and and you also have the service providers themselves you have airtel which has its own logo which went and changed some time back uh, you have uh, reliance communications jio which is a new uh, entrant into the uh, field so almost all businesses and this is something which we covered in the uh, class on uh, trademarks would want their brands to be protected by way of a trademark so 
trademark is a generic intellectual property right that can apply to any business which deals with goods or services and so that is how a trademark is defined so apart from the application of trademark which any business would find relevant the most important intellectual property right that affects the telecommunication industry are patents now we say patents because the entire telecommunication industry is set by certain standards now we know that 5g is a standard say similarly 4g which was lte technology that was a standard 3g was another standard so the the way in which telecommunication industry operates is that there are standard setting organizations there are certain standards that are set and there are players who try to achieve those standards so when a standard is chosen and there, they have a process by which they can choose standards when a ch standard is chosen that be becomes the default norm for the entire industry now standards are essential so that you know just like people who want to talk to each other on the phone the first thing they need to know do is that their handsets and their networks should first talk to each other so having standards helps instruments and handsets and the the different types of technologies to talk to each other the fact that you can make a phone call from an airtel uh, airtel service provider using an iphone and somebody else who has an android phone in another place with an who is connected to, to an other service provider can receive the call is because of standards so standards helps technology to talk to each other and it makes the world a much better and a connected place now in the absence of standard you can see that you know each uh, company would be developing its own standard and there could be instances where the standards cannot operate or interplay with each other now you will normally find this issue uh, when when you try to download a particular software and you find that windows does not support it or you find that uh, you know the the um, max i o um, the mac operating system does not support it so standards are essential for interoperability of technology the fact that usb is a common standard allows every machine which uh, which a, any computer or a desktop or a laptop to read it and that's because usb is an industry standard now the fact that patents affect the telecommunication industry is by covering the technology that becomes a part of the standard so if there is a patent covering a technology which becomes a part of a standard and there is agreement that it is a uh, it is something essential to the standard we call such patents as standard essential patents seps now seps if you take uh, any technology that is in 4g for instance the the uh, the wifi technology or bluetooth or 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 the uh, or the bandwidth in which uh, uh, the mobile phones communicate you will find that that is a standard that has been set by the industry and they will have many patents which fall within that standard now for instance ericsson may have some standards uh, patents falling within that standard uh, qualcomm may have Uh, broadcom there are other uh, uh, interdigital there are many various other companies who would have created technology which falls on that standard now the idea of a standard essential patent is that any patent that is declared as falling within the standard and which uh, which is called a standard essential patent the patent owner would give a commitment to license the patent on frand terms f r a n d and now frand stands for for uh, frand stands for uh, 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 fair reasonable and non discriminatory terms now now the fairness reasonableness and the fact that the license has to be non discriminatory refers to uh, uh kind of a license by which you give a license on equal terms to everyone for instance if ericsson offers a license to say uh, motorola then a similar a fair a similar license has to be offered because it is covered by a frand terms the license has to be fair it has to be on reasonable terms and it should not discriminate be between the parties to whom the license is given now a frand license would essentially mean that 
a person who's using the technology can actually use the technology first and not worry about getting the license because it's already there is a commitment to give it on front term so in the industry the peop, uh, the the uh, the users of the technology use the technology and then they negotiate with the license owner license holder and then settle for royalty rates that have to be given to the license holder this does not normally happen when it comes to patents in a normal case where the patents do not form a part of a standard if you use the technology without the permission of the patent holder then there can be there can be an infringement suit against that person stopping the person's activity so standard essential patents because these patents form a part of the standard they there is a commitment to give the patents on a license and that license is what we call fran fran is also called a rand in the in the united states where the fare is dropped and it's called reasonable and non discriminatory terms so the license is a reasonable license so the existence of a fran license or a rand license helps us to use the technology the users to use the technology without the fear of the patent holder stopping them which would normally happen in the case of a patent which is not covered by a fran commitment so telecommunication industry especially the ones which are which operate on the mobile telephony sector are uh, the most important right for them is to know about standard essential patents how the licensing happens for standard essential patents and there is some amount of a litigation that happens in this field as well where the right holders try to enforce uh, and get a royalty and because of which there could be some court orders against uh, against certain parties so in the recent past we had cases involving ericsson and uh, uh, and uh, gioni and um, M- micromax certain indian handset manufacturers so so the, so that's the uh that's a short answer for with regard to uh the intellectual property rights that affect the telecommunication industry uh and you could also have a telecommunication industry again is a broad uh, term which could uh, refer to uh, which could uh, refer to um, a, a whole lot of players uh, for instance you could uh, you could also look uh they, they could be chip manufacturers or manufacturers of technology who form a part of this uh, for instance intel and and then again you would uh, uh, which would mean that um uh, th- that the the protection for the chips are also covered so there is a special regime for protecting uh, limi- uh layouts of semiconductor chips and we have a separate regime for that Uh, but that's not uh, been uh, uh, the preferred way of protecting chips uh, so so we will we'll be covering that in the forthcoming lectures okay now i move to the second question uh, this second question is on the patent agent exam uh, so so that's something which we can uh, keep it aside or answer in a different forum uh, then the third question here is is it possible to supply complete pdf material at the end of the course if supplied then is it easy to prepare for the end exam now the pdf material largely in a online course would be the pdf of the ppts the the, the slides that you see uh, there is some bit of animation that happens in the slide so uh, sometimes we when we create the uh, pdf i mean the pdfs which is largely the converting the ppts uh, it may not be a very uh, useful thing because of some of the animation that we may use but nevertheless we can give you copies of the ppt and the ppt is becomes your uh, the default study material we had also linked you to the wipo course uh, and also the course uh, which was conducted by the ugc yeah yeah we have we have shared those uh, uh, links as well so the there is enough material on the there is enough material on the 
uh, on this uh, either you can look at the wipo material wipo stands for the world intellectual property organization and th those materials are publicly available and there are also materials created by the government of india as a part of the ugc e patshala so th so these are things that you already have in the public domain in the public domain so you could have uh, you could access that and we would also be uh, giving you uh, links to the materials that we are referring to now uh, please provide simple note for beginners now that's the answer to this earlier question covers this as well uh, we, there are links to a very basic material uh, from uh, the wipo uh, we'll be sharing the links again uh, wipo as well as e patshala which is in uh, which was uh, done by the UGC. If there is a pre-grant opposition filed against an applicant under section 25.1, which claims can be challenged for such opposition? Will it be the claims of the applicant published or pending as amended before? Uh, okay, this uh, a, a question comes from our uh, class on patents where we had covered uh, pre-grant opposition, opposition as well. Now, just to answer this, uh, when you file a pre-grant opposition, a pre-grant opposition has to be filed sometime before the grant of a patent. The law says that the pre-grant opposition has to be filed at a time before the patent is granted. And the starting point for filing a pre-grant opposition is after the application is published. And we know that an application when it is published is not the application that gets eventually granted because the published ap application is the form in which the applicant had filed it. Le then there are questions raised by the patent office, what we call the first statement of objections or the first examination report, FER, and the applicant replies to the FER. There are amendments made in response to the objections raised. And so, so you will find that the application as filed in the normal course is not the application that gets granted so there is a difference between the application that gets filed and the application that gets granted similarly there is always a difference between the application that for which an opposition is filed and the application which is or or the claims which are actually argued at the point of hearing because between the filing of the opposition so assume that the application is filed, uh, published and an opposition is immediately filed and the uh, the application undergoes examination and at the end of the examination the controller calls for a hearing shares the uh, pre-grant opposition and fixes a hearing now by this time the pre-grant opposition always happens after the controller examines the patent the, he, he examines the patent and the controller comes to a conclusion that Yes, this patent can be granted. What we say under section 43, we say it is made ready for a grant. The patent is ready for a grant and only then they would look into the objections that are filed by pre-grant opposition. So there is always an effort that the controller puts in before we look into the pre-grant opposition. That effort is nothing but statement of objections raised by the controller and answers given by the applicant. So most likely, in most of the cases, you will find that it is not the application that is taken up at the time of hearing of the pre-grant opposition is not the application that was published. So there may be some claims that are dropped, some claims that are revised, some changes made. So what the applicant would get is that the applicant would get a chance to file a revised grounds of opposition on the claims because the claims have now been amended so this is an opportunity in practice it is given to the applicant because when the applicant files an opposition it is done early in the day but if the application undergoes certain amendments and after the amendment the controller feels that it is made ready for a grant because if the controller feels that it is not ready for a grant 
the controller will reject it even without the pre-ground opposition. The controller will reject it under section 15. There is a provision for rejecting that. So only when it's made ready for a grant will the controller be allowing the pre-ground opponent for a hearing. So at that point, we can assume that there are changes in the normal course. I mean, we have seen it in most cases, there are some changes that happen to the application. So normally, the pre-ground opponent is given another chance to file additional objections. But largely, we find that the arguments tend to be the same. They could be a couple of grounds that the applicant has given up. But largely, if there is an attack on inventive step, if there is an attack on novelty, those things tend to remain the same because novelty and inventive step are based on the disclosure that the applicant makes. So, uh, so, so to, to, to sum it up, uh, the claims that will be challenged will be the claims that the controller has approved and what the controller feels is ready for the grant. And today we have the entire prosecution history available on the website. So by the time the, the controller calls for a hearing, it should be possible for the pre-grant opponent to tell the controller that I filed an opposition based on the claims as published. There has been a change and these are my revised submissions. It is possible for the uh, for the pre-grant opponent to do that. And 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 uh, the and as we already mentioned, uh, there is always a difference between the claims as published and the claims that get into just before the hearing of the pre-grant opposition. So so in practice, the pre-grant opponent gets a chance to file a revised statement if it is required. The next question is, uh, what are the future scope of intellectual property? Oh, this is a, uh, it, it's a foundational question. Uh, it, it requires a very detailed answer. But you can see that uh, for the first time uh, uh, in independent India, in 2016, we had the first national IPR policy. So I would just uh, briefly state that uh, for anything which the Indian government comes out with a policy, is a matter of national importance. And that is because uh, we can see uh, quite a lot of jobs being generated in the future. I, it, it, we can see this sector as something that is tied to the growth of the country. So there is uh, the, the scope of intellectual property is uh, tied to the knowledge industry that most of us are a part of today. So any kind of protection on the products of knowledge can be protected by intellectual property. So a short definition for intellectual property is that it can protect the products of creative labor. So creative knowledge, labor includes knowledge that human beings generate. So anything that is tied to the knowledge economy, so to say, can be protected by intellectual property. So intellectual property's growth is something which has been of recent origin. The word was not there in use, say, 100 years ago. Nobody was using these words. But now it's become a part of the vocabulary of almost every major nation. Uh, countries have been coming up with their intellectual property rights. And it's just not important just from the uh, growth or from an economic perspective. It is also relevant from the public interest perspective. Because what you do in an intellectual property right, regardless of what it is, it could be a patent, it could be a trademark, it could be a copyright. You are carving out a private right from what you can identify as the public domain. So when you file a patent, there is existing knowledge in that field, much of which could be common. And you are now trying to say that this is a private right, though everything else surrounding this or upon which this is built may belong to the public domain. So this act of carving out a private right from the public domain or from what belongs to the masses could also affect the rights of the public at large. So there is a public interest element in almost every intellectual property that, right, that you can think of. The public interest element in trademark may not be uh, so uh, apparent. For instance, uh, if just because Apple chose to use a common name Apple for selling computer products, we cannot have any grouse against it. People in general cannot have any objection towards it. But even in trademark law, 
there are instances where you cannot appropriate something that belongs to the public now we had covered the absolute grounds of objections in our trademark lecture which actually says that you cannot use generic words you cannot use descriptive words you cannot use common words in describing your product so this again is to protect the interest of the public and in uh, in pharmaceutical uh, trademarks uh, there is this concept called publicis juris now publicis juris refers to something that belongs to the common pool uh, in pharmaceuticals you will know that there is this tendency to name drugs based on either the ailment or or say for instance i'll just mention something which is commonly known there is there, there used to be a drug called coldarin so the, you you name a drug based on the ailment or you name a drug based on the um, the organ in the body that it affects or it helps to rejuvenate say liv52 liv stands for liver or it could be based on uh, on a chemical ingredient involved for instance uh, pioglitazole is a chemical ingredient so you could have pios as a name of a drug so you will find many drug names are based on Uh, uh, these these are the common ways in which trademarks with regard to drugs are created so you could tie your trademark to a uh, to a, a chemical name you could tie it to a organ you could tie it to a disease now there are distinct advantages of doing this because once you do this it's easy to recollect the doctor who normally prescribes the drug is able, able to recollect this or a per- patient if it's an over the counter drug which you can buy over the counter recollects it by the name of the disease or by name of the uh, organ it 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 hits mostly patients are not conversant with the chemical names but other than that the the idea of tying a trademark with a known word is for easy recollection now this being the case in pharmaceutical trademarks you will find quite a lot of overlapping marks because the chemical is common for everyone so but when you try to enforce those marks like 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 one company which sells uh, a a drug by name pios p i o z wants to stop another company which is selling just pio p i o and they all come from the chemical name pioglitazone now then what the courts will say that both of you have taken from the common pool so you will not have the the distinctive feature in your mark is limited because you all took from the common pool So this is a concept in trademark law, which is called publicis juris, which allows you to take from the public pool, but because you took from the public pool, you cannot stop or claim any exclusivity over what you took from the public pool. So uh, again, uh, th- th- that was just an il- illustration of even in trademark law, which is generally uh, does not have uh, public interest issues like copyright a- a- law or the patent law. Uh, even there you will find that there are instances where the public rights could get affected uh, and and we had already mentioned uh, compulsory licensing is a way in which you can circumscribe the right of the right holder and allow the public to use it for instance compulsory licenses can be granted for patents uh, f- f- to make the if if it is if it is a if the product is something which the public requires at an affordable price or if it is not available to the public for various uh, reasons you could issue a compulsory license which is a forced license there is uh, there is no uh, authorization given by the owner so it's used without authorization so you could force a license so that it could benefit the public so you have that mechanism in patents you also have compulsory license mechanism for copyright but we don't have that for trademark and this is something which we have covered in our lectures uh, that goes to tell us that the public interest element in trademark law it is there nevertheless it is there is much limited when it uh, when 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 we compare to compare it with uh, patents or copyright and that's also because the way in which trademark has evolved our uh, trademark law does not give a monopoly over the product or the services it does not give it gives a monopoly only in the usage of the word so you could always enter that same field uh, you could still sell computers but only thing is you can't use apple 
So it is not a monopoly in the field, whereas a patent is a monopoly on the field. The technology is completely covered. Nobody else can use it. So, so this vital distinction uh, allows us to understand that uh, in terms of public rights, the one which is least affected is in the field of trademark. But even in trademark, you do have issues where uh, the, the enforcement of a right could get affected based on certain public uh, consideration like uh, what I mentioned, publicized jurors. Okay, that's a short answer on what is the scope of intellectual property. And th this is a growing field, as you would know, uh, the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO, was established under the United Nations somewhere in the 1960s. So we are still in the uh, early stages of growth of intellectual property. And especially in our country, because we have had a, a IPR policy, national policy recently, and, and we have streamlining various uh, Organ, uh, structures within the patent office. Uh, the copyright used to be uh, with the Ministry of uh, Human Resources and Development. Now it has come to the Ministry of Industry and Commerce. So we, we found a consolidation of rights. So the, there's quite a lot of changes happening in this field. Uh, there is a question on uh, TRIPS and hybrid seed. Uh, so the and uh, about a recent acquisition of Monsanto by Bayer. Now we will be covering this in uh, the future classes because there is a special regime called the Plant Varieties Act for short. So we will be covering that and and we have a case study to uh, to cover in that as well. Uh, book PDF uh, we had already mentioned there are uh, with regard to intellectual property rights uh, we have uh, quite a lot of public resources uh, like the WIPO has uh, enough material on IP and and the UGC had uh, a recent course on e Shala. Those are all publicly available. So we will uh, we will we, we had already shared those links. We will be sharing these those links again. Okay, okay now let me just so so Please hold on. I'm just trying to. Yeah, I'm just trying to expand the Excel sheet. Yeah, yeah, this is fine. OK, thank you. Uh, now, now uh, the next question is on uh, the next question. Okay, I missed out uh, something here. Um, there is a question on convention application. Okay, we can we can share that uh, example with you. Uh, see, in a convention application. The application is filed as a convention application in a convention country, and and so so you uh, the question is whether we can show the bibliographical page as it exists in a, uh, a PCT or the WIPO application. So so we will share that with you. Uh, what is the relevance of IPR in Make in India scenario? Again, uh, the IPR as we have touched upon our in our earlier lectures. When we look at the world as an intangible economy, and there's quite a lot of intangible stuff that is happening in our economy right now, you will find that if we are going to what it, it, it comes down to the question, what are we trying to make in India? If India is going to focus on the intangibles, then IPR will be of very, very high relevance because you need to protect those intangibles. And the protection of intangibles comes only through the IPR regime. There is no other way in which we can protect the intangibles that we develop. So if Make in India is going to be a manufacturing uh, focused attempt, then yes, still you can have 
uh, quite a lot of IPRs protecting the manufacturing sector. But the focus of the intellectual property regime is on intangibles. So if the focus is going to be on intangibles, and if Make in India is going to focus us to in sectors where intangibles are relevant, then the relevance will be much more than it would be in a uh, in the usual manufacturing uh, focused you know uh, setups. Yeah. No. Okay, there is a question on uh, what we call parallel inventing. If by coincidence, almost same type of invention is invented and patent applications are filed by two almost concurrent inventors on the same day, then by which methodology can she prove uh, the true and first inventor of the invention? Now, uh, I'm assuming that the questioner wants to know that two inventions of the same type were filed on the same day in the same patent office. Now, who gets the priority, so to speak? Now, the patent office has a practice of receiving almost everything with a timestamp. And all the more when you are doing an e-filing. So, so you will have a timestamp. Uh, the world now follows a first to file principle. So whoever files first gets the invention regardless of who invented first. The United States still recently had the first to invent principle, so the, which actually opens up a whole lot of litigation to show who was the first inventor. So you may have to bring in records from your lab. You may have to bring witnesses to show that you were the prior inventor. So all that is now avoided because the world now says, regardless of whether you invented first, the person who approaches the patent office first would get the patent. So right now, if you look at concurrent events of inventing, the patent office now has a timestamp and it will go by the timestamp. Whoever approached the patent office first, regardless of which patent office, it could be, you know that you could have international filings, you could have, you could file in any patent office and then enter into uh, through the PCT route. So what matters is who filed first. And that is why we had mentioned that the world now follows the first to file principle. Okay, the Indian Patent Office strategy procedure, and it, it's just the Indian Patent Office is not concerned about who really invented it first. So the principle is the first inventor to file. So the first to file principle can be rephrased as the first inventor to file. The first inventor who filed the patent in the Patent Office gets it. And this is now employed not just in the Indian Patent Office, but across the board. All the patent offices now follow the first to file principle. So the inventor who files first gets the patent, regardless of who actually invented it first. OK, uh, this will be covered in our uh, session on copyright. Now, uh, content writers want to know to what extent they can take from other copyrighted articles. Uh, you could say if you want to, uh, the law has changed substantially uh, because we have a decision from the Delhi High Court, what is called the Delhi photocopying case, which involved Delhi University and some publishers. Uh, so, the, the, so normally a copyright holder will allow you to copy few pages of the text. Now you can quote if the book is a 200 page book, then there is there shouldn't be any harm in taking a photocopy of a page or a two in the normal course. Now, content writers should always be wary of reproducing the content. So the so so if you look at the uh, the most preferred way of reproducing content is not to produce it lock, stock and barrel because the internet and all the technologies and tools on it allow you to actually cut, paste, and reproduce in a very easy way. But content uh, uh, creators should be careful enough 
not to copy a uh, copyrighted work on the internet especially and portray it uh, portray it in a manner that almost the entire work is um, work is published and is accessible for free uh, there are there is no clear cut practice here to say that what could be that uh, that critical limit beyond which there could be an action against you or what could be the minimum permissible limit in terms of word count or in terms of pages we don't know of any uh, uh, acceptable or universally accepted uh, range what you can copy but copying is normally done with one by giving reference so that's mandatory whatever you take you have to give the reference two uh, if it is a if if you are copying an idea that is covered then it is always better that you put it in your own words so paraphrasing it in your own words will not amount to copyright infringement because you are conveying an idea attributing the idea to a person and putting it in your own words so that's a safe practice so th these are the two things that you need to worry about so there is no strict limit that we can tell you uh, it may change depending on the book it may change depending on the subject uh, but what we can tell you is uh, so there is a restriction of how much you can copy and there is also a uh, the best practice will be to paraphrase it and give attribute the source from where you are taking now these things don't apply when it comes to uh using the material for educational purposes uh the daily photocopy case uh, which we will be covering in some detail in this uh, in the in the forthcoming lectures actually uh, uh, actually says that if you are using it for educational purposes then you can even copy uh, the entire chapter in a book if it's necessary because the case involved the course pack that is given to students in delhi university and the course pack included a combination of chapters from different books and the delhi high court said that it's it's fine if it is done for educational purposes so again uh, the the limit the way you copy it how you accredit and the purpose for you, which you copy will will actually determine the extent to which you can copy for instance if you're going to do it for educational purposes within a classroom then the delhi high court decision tells you that uh you could take whatever you want if it is for the purpose of uh, educating students uh so so commercial purposes are different when it comes to educational purposes so there's quite a lot of detail that you need to know before you do this uh ipr and cyber crime now uh, now this is something that needs some clarification uh, there is nothing like ipr in a cyber crime uh, see cyber crime there is a particular act uh, information technology act which tells how crime can be committed or information theft with regard to an information uh, hacking and uh, what you call phishing and various things are covered in that act that is not related to any intellectual property right at best you can say that all databases have a copyright and the copyright regime can protect a computer database that is all you can say ipr and cyber crime are not linked in any other way except for the fact that some iprs may have some criminal consequences the fact that you infringe certain ipr like copyright and trademark can have criminal consequences say it can be regarded as a crime cyber crime is a crime that is committed with regard to largely information or nowadays even with regard to money which is committed using information technology so so but but you find ipr and cyber crime as you know uh, uh, people packaging this and selling writing books on it giving offering courses but you need to understand that ipr is a different domain when it comes to information technology and cyber crimes it's a, it's a completely different domain uh when a mom key clicks a picture on a camera then to whom will the copyright okay uh, all iprs this is uh, just not true for uh, uh, the pictures uh, taken by uh, animals uh, this is true for all intellectual property rights intellectual property rights at the starting of this session i'd said that protects the products of human creative labor so the human is important so so if you are getting confused with regard to what can be 
a subject matter of IPR, it has to be even machine generated things cannot be protected by IPR. Okay, machine generated things may have some relevance in the copyright sector, but patents cannot be granted to things that are generated by anything other than humans. So at, at least for now, it is like that. Tomorrow with artificial intelligence, we may tweak these things a bit, but right now it is the products of creative labor. And by creative labor, we are essentially referring to human creative labor. So there was this case uh, of the monkey taking a selfie and the courts have ruled that there won't be any copyright in it. If two persons uh, are inventors of a pattern and one without the, we have already answered this. Oh, no, 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 this is a different question. Two, uh, without the knowledge of the second person, the first person has filed a patent as an applicant. How can the second person join as applicant? Please suggest the sections of opposition and revocation. Okay. Uh, see, there are two ways to do this. If an application has been filed, without the knowledge of an inventor. Then the inventor can oppose the application. So there are two inventors, A and B. A files an application without making B also as an inventor. And, and I would assume that it's just not an issue of being mentioned as inventor. I would assume this to be an ownership issue because the question does not say whether the issue is with regard to mentioning just invention because the mentioning of invention inventor there is a different section section 26 which can take care of this issue if ownership is an issue you know two people work together and one person files a patent leaving out the other person that's an ownership issue you want you, you, you your concern is not just to be shown as an inventor which is more like a moral right but your concern is that the invention 50 percent of it should belong to you or, or some percentage which you would agree with the other person. Now, there are approaches for this issue. You can file an opposition under 25.1 and ask the patent to be revoked because it was wrongfully obtained. 25.1a talks about instances where a patent can be wrongfully obtained. You can say that this was wrongfully obtained and you can ask for a revocation. Now, in such cases, the patent will get revoked and nobody may get the patent. So you could also explore to wait and then file a post ground opposition after the patent is granted. When the patent is granted post grant, you have an opportunity to not ask for a revocation. You can raise an objection saying that it is wrongfully granted, but you could ask the controller to give the invention in your name so that you can proceed with it. Now, if it is a case where you own only 50% of the invention because you are B and A has also contributed 50, then the, the controller can actually give you a share of the invention. There's a provision in the law to do that. Assume you miss the post grant bus, which means you realize about this only one year after the grant. Still, you can raise it as an objection in revocation. You can you can raise it as an objection and revocation. And there is a provision under Section 52 where you can. If somebody else takes the uh, if it is wrongfully obtained from you, you can use Section 52 to say that that pattern can be rather than revoking the pattern, it can be assigned to you or it can be uh, what you call um, it can be reissued in your name. So there are provisions in the act. So the strategy will be to look at whether you want to knock off the invention so that nobody gets it or whether you want it to come in your name. And you should also be clear whether your concern is only to be mentioned as an inventor or whether you want to be treated as an owner. So there are provisions under 25. There are provisions in 64 where you can question it as being wrongfully obtained. And you can also look into Section 52 of the Patents Act. Okay, the monkey. Uh, okay, the next question is please describe the specific difference between copyright and transfer. Uh, the copyright lecture is the next one. So, Monday onwards, you will be seeing that copyright is simply the right to make more copies. So, transfer is the transfer itself is not, uh, it could be a 
uh, let us say if you meant by transfer if you meant sale okay copyright a copyrighted product can be a subject matter of a sale it can also be the subject matter of a license in a sale the copyright owner loses all right that he has it is completely given in a license only a limited license limited right is given so all the software which you license from microsoft is not by sale though you may get an impression that you bought it from amazon and it was a sale amazon had offered it on a sale nevertheless the license the terms of the license which microsoft sells to you is in the way of a license which means you have a limited right you cannot do many things which microsoft has mentioned in its long list of terms and conditions a monkey clicking a picture on a camera is an intellectual effort why is it false okay uh, we had mentioned this uh, the iprs as we know today pertain to human intellectual efforts we still have not come up with a regime for protecting the intellectual efforts of animals so far so because human beings a person in all the acts are defined including the criminal uh, indian penal code it is referred as a human being a person is a human being and that's why you know uh, you cannot imprison uh, animals for uh, acts they, they can as well kill people but still you cannot imprison them the way we do with humans so and and the concept of a crime involves something called mens rea you should have a guilty state of mind if you don't have a guilty state of mind then you cannot commit a crime now the guilty state of mind is very hard at least to my knowledge to determine whether the an animal which committed a crime had a guilty state of mind so we would normally not try to impose laws that were made for human beings onto animals and we are going to have this another set of uh, debates and reforms where we are going to discuss whether we can impose laws that were created for human beings for things that are created by machines products of artificial intelligence we are soon going we are already having that debate but right now the intellectual property regime only covers human effort so intellectual effort or a creative effort is referred to as an human effort and uh, there is a decision of the us court on why the monkey selfie should not be granted an ipr it's a detailed decision we can share that with you on the forum so so if, if you can just raise a pertinent question we can just share that for so that everybody gets the benefit of it okay if the inventory depends on what you meant by an inventory if your inventory is made of physical goods it is simply not an intangible asset if your inventory is goods in a go down which can be touched felt and which take physical space we don't call it an intangible asset an intangible asset is an investment that is made or 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 an asset in which an investment is made we had already mentioned that which is hard to recover when you compare it with a physical asset for instance uh, assume that there are certain goods in a go down and these goods are meant for construction but the construction does not happen and you are able to sell this as scrap okay you are able to recover some amount of money from physical goods which were there in an inventory or or which were stocked in your godown or in your yard so if you want to close down the business if you want to liquidate it physical goods may get you some value something or the other at least as scrap you will get that value assume that you had uh, 200 people working together on a project to create a software now assume that this was in the year 2005 now almost all software we created around 2005 have either become redundant or does not have any meaning today or it does not even match with the systems that we have today so if today if you want to sell that software say i mean if to, using your terminology if it is a part of the inventory now that being an intangible asset there won't be any buyers in 2018 for a software that was written in 2005 i'm assuming that it was written in an outdated platform and it's in a thing which is of no relevance so the effort that went into paying the salaries of all those 200 coders and keeping them in your office giving them salaries and 
and all the money that was invested in developing this code you cannot recover it in the way in which you can do it for a physical asset so this is one of the distinctions that we brought out but by inventory if it, the inventory pertains to physical goods it cannot be regarded as an intangible asset and if the inventory is like an inventory of software code yes it could be because the definition of an intangible asset is not tied to whether it is a part of an inventory in fact we had given how we came up with a the four s with regard to the intangible assets what are the four qualities an intangible asset has okay uh, this is a very specific question and i think it is uh, with regard to the patent agent exam so we would want you to raise this in the forum uh, in, in the appropriate forum so that we can answer it this is with regard to usage of forms uh, we can answer that in a we'll be answering that in a different forum uh, rights of inventors in a patent granted to an applicant okay the right of the inventor uh, is a, the inventor has a right to be mentioned as the inventor that is under section 28 uh, i'd mentioned it as 26 earlier uh, sorry correction it's 28 so uh, the inventor is uh, has a right of recognition he has a right to be recognized as the inventor regardless of who owns the invention what money is made out of it who is the ultimate beneficiary in terms of commercializing the invention so this the right of the inventor is th the fact that he will be recognized as an inventor of the invention and that right can be enforced by uh, uh, the mechanism that is stipulated in section 28 Okay, this is a question. Um, let me try to. Um, uh, 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 why should we? I've read the question, but I'm just trying to. Uh, why should we have, if I've understood the question right, uh, product patents for medicine, agricultural products? Uh, why we are depending on reverse engineering of these products? Now, the question is not clear. Okay, uh, if it meant, uh, why should we have patent protection at all? Then the, then the answer is that patents act at some level, they act as incentives for investment. If patents are not there, then a question could arise that will a drug company invest billions of dollars and time and effort in developing a drug, knowing fully well that if it de develops a drug, somebody else may copy it. So that's one argument on that patents have uh, act as an incentive for investment uh, and and i didn't get the question on uh, reverse engineering um, or, or if the question meant that uh, in the absence of patents yes it is easy to reverse engineer products and uh, but but this does not hold true for all fields uh, it may hold true for pharmaceuticals it may not hold true for computer software because uh, it, re reverse engineering is a way in which people are able to find and develop new code. And, and we find that, you know, even without the patent as an in, in, in incentive, uh, a software has developed as an industry, even without the use of patents as a means of protection. Uh, okay, India explicitly bar business method patents, then why are they being accepted in few cases? Okay, this we need to know that uh, the law as it exists in the books may not be the law that is implemented. There could be some variance as to what is there in the book and to what actually happens in practice. Because when a patent is filed, there's quite a lot of factors that go into before the patent gets granted. The objections that are raised by the examiners, uh, the reasons that are given to get over the objections, uh, the, the kind of objections uh, or, or the changes that the applicant makes to the patent, there are quite a lot of factors that get into before a patent is granted. And for all we know, what appears as a business method may not 
be a business method or they could be a way to uh, reclassify or to look at something else as not being a purely business method so there are different ways in which we can understand this indian patent uh, the the patents act explicitly bars business method patents no doubt about it but some of the patents covering business methods are still being granted and 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 we know that uh, and this was also pointed out in a case before the ipb that you know business patents are being granted why in a in a case that was being argued the applicant's patent was rejected so the applicant argued saying that uh, while other patents are being granted why just pick me so the argument that was actually recorded in the order is that if the business patents are brought before the court of law and this was before the intellectual property ipab appellate board the appellate board said that if they are brought we will we will revoke it so today we are in a situation where some patents may get granted which may be against the law but there is a mechanism by which it can be checked so if somebody is interested or if it's a competitor who feels that a business method has been granted which should not have been granted the competitor can file a revocation petition and most likely the revocation petition will be allowed if it's a business method because we have a case involving yahoo uh, where a business method patent was rejected so so there is as i said there could be a slight mismatch between the law in the books and what happens in the practice uh, as long as there are ways in which we can correct it i think that we should put our focus on that saying that you know if a patent is wrongly granted if the law allows you or any person interested to revoke it yes there will be some cost and effort involved in it but if it's a competitor then the competitor it's in the interest of the competitor to move forward and ask for a revocation ip in indian information technology how, how it can take care for ip protection uh, see information technology there are some parts of ip that could be relevant uh, protection of databases because information technology is largely about information presented through databases so th there is copyright protection for that Uh, apart from that uh, there is uh, very little that we need to cover in an intellectual property course because uh, database protection is covered by copyright other than that information technology uh, there are some uh, like like just the earlier question uh, some business methods are being filed as patents uh, there are computer related inventions cris uh, which could also merit a patent uh, but the uh, but the law on that has been uh, in a form of uh, in in constant change we had uh, earlier guidelines from the patent office saying that a patent can be granted only if there is a novel hardware along with the software now the latest set of guidelines don't actually say that so there is a, a uncertainty with when it comes to the way in which the guidelines have been uh, have been changing over the last few years what are the main technologies affected by standard essential patents in telecommunication industry uh, see in telecommunication industry 5g or 4g is a standard and this standard if you can do some basic reading on that is employed to ensure that the phones talk to each other the phones talk to the towers and the towers talk to each other so this entire gamut of things that need to operate in sync so that if i make a call from here you are able to receive it at the other end is covered by standards so there are standard setting organizations which set the standards and the common standard ensures that you can uh, the mission scan the, the basic uh, uh, understanding is that missions can be interoperable if there are common standards so any technology that forms a part of a standard and which is covered by a patent and it should be essential to the standard because there can be non essential patents which are which don't fall directly on the standard so these can be protected by a patent so in the telecommunication industry you have standard essential patents on 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 equipment on tower on transmission on chip 
on handsets. In fact, the, the, the common saying is that a smartphone on an average has close to 250,000 patterns in it. So, so you can understand. So the, all those patterns may not actually map on the handset itself, but it could relate to um, how the technology is, uh, how, how, how sound waves are transmitted from the tower, how it is received, so quite a lot of uh, equipments involved in it. So this, these are the main technologies that SCPs cover. They cover uh, the chips, they cover the transmission, they cover the base stations, they cover handsets as well. Okay, what are the major intellectual uh, faced by artists in the music industry? With the advent of YouTube piracy, these artists lose potential value. How is this tackled? Now, now this uh, this is not, uh, in my opinion, this is not a problem of um, any particular industry. Um, with with the even before the advent of YouTube, we had uh, like Napster, we had other forms of uh, free sharing which were seen as something which could affect the industry. But if you look at it more impassionately, it did not affect the industry per se. The industry seems to be still thriving. What it did affect was it affected an earlier model of doing business. That's it. So uh, as we come with new technology, as we come with new ways of sharing things, uh, the new models of earning revenue will move. And, uh, now, one of the... Uh, uh, in uh, one of the examples that is often cited is that with the advent of free sharing, the live performances of certain artists have become more in demand. I mean, they just moved to a way in which, you know, the, there is more uh, people would actually pay for a live performance than they would pay for a recording. That's one way to look at it. The second way, if you look at uh, uh, with regard to, uh, with regard to, um, but broadcasting, you will find that something which you watch on a smaller screen uh, may not be as uh, uh, as effective or as uh, enjoyable as a big screen experience. So again, you could people have been now selling experiences, the same format. You can watch it on YouTube, but if you're going to watch it in a in a in a IMAX or a, on a, on a larger screen with a better uh, surround uh, a sound system, then that's going to be th that. Again, another business model that has evolved, which could tackle the issue of uh, issue of uh, you know sharing. So, so I don't see this as an um, issue that uh, affects IP. I see this as a change that the industry should now offer. Um, uh, 3i of the Patents Act, any process, okay, the method of treatment. My question is whether in India, personal treatment like offered by Gilead in Escarta is also patentable. Now, uh, a method of treatment, which is using a uh, medicine for treating something, the, the protocol of treatment, saying that one tablet so many times a day, but uh, the protocol of treatment is regarded as a method of treatment if it, the protocol uses drugs uh, it cannot be patented in india and there have been instances where uh, as i said the law may not in practice may not match the law in the books uh, in a recent uh, a study that we conducted uh, we had identified more than 60 patents which were granted for methods of treatment which were actually against the law in the book so again the the, the what we need to worry about is that uh, there are mechanisms by which you could object them. Public interest groups or competitors who are interested can question them. So uh, personalized treatment would technically come under uh, 3i if it involves a method of treating a disease. Now, I'm not getting into the, I, I do not know about uh, Yescarta. I'm just uh, broadly giving you the law as it is mentioned in section 3i any process for medicinal surgical curative prophylactic diagnostic therapeutic or other treatment of human beings or any process for a similar treatment of animals to render them free of disease or to increase their economic value cannot be subject matter of a patent so i do not know about the details of yescarta and gilead's 
uh, and 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 what is the personalized treatment but i'm just telling you 3i would normally prohibit the grant of a patents on that i am an inventor and filed a provisional application for a particular product i invented i filed a complete specification within one year and the same got published published in public but recently i came to know that uh, that one of my fellows stealing my idea, he manufactured and sold the product in the market. I came to know recently. Um, okay, uh, this is, seems to be a, 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 a question based on somebody's uh, uh, personal experience. Now we are we are just we can answer that in a forum. If you can raise it in, a, in another forum, we can try to answer that. Uh, so we are just confining ourselves to the questions uh, which. Uh, we have uh, covered so far in our lessons uh, the i can still answer this i just get the gist of the if someone else is using your invention and selling products which are covered by a new, your invention you can put the person on notice because now you say that it is your invention is now published you can put the person on notice and say that when the patent is granted you will sue them and you will get damages for all the money that or for all the loss that person has caused to you which is a direct consequence of his action so what you would do is you would send a notice saying that there is a patent pending and ask that person to stop manufacturing or selling the goods and after you notice because after you notice if he continues to do that when the patent gets granted now if you are a uh, uh, a startup if you are a, if you can qualify as a startup then you can also expedite the grant of your patent there is a provision by which you can take a request for an expedited examination and you can expedite the grant because you can only file a case once it is granted so you can expedite the grant put the person on notice expedite the grant provided you are a startup or you qualify as a startup and then get the patent granted and file a case to stop this person. I recently came to. Yeah. So, so if you if your provisional was filed before the products came into the market, you are a prior player. So your priority is preserved. So if you get the patent granted, then you can stop these people. How can I draft patents? Now, you uh, drafting patents involves certain techniques. Uh, there are certain uh, we, the last. Uh, year we offered a course on drafting patterns. We'll be repeating that next year. Uh, so probably you can enroll for that. It gives you the fundamentals of drafting. There are certain legal techniques to be employed in drafting and that has to be learned as a skill. What is the reason why software patenting is not allowed in India? And Okay. Uh, uh, the, the general agreement is that softwares can be protected by effectively by copyright. Uh, the fact that over the before uh, Apple became the world's most valuable company and Apple again makes considerable amount of money because of its software which are all protected by copyright around the world. The most valuable company for some time was Microsoft. Microsoft again has almost all its products protected by software. They have some patents but Microsoft and Apple don't uh, are not where did not start off by protecting their uh, products through patents it, it all started off by protecting their software to uh, through uh, through a copyright so we know that software can be effectively protected by copyright and we have instances of some of the major companies today which have been beneficiaries of this protection extending patent protection for software is not something which the entire world is in agreement with so some countries like india we exclude software protection per se so you cannot patent code in india you cannot copy paste code and say this is protected because anything that is literally expressed we have another regime the copyright regime so because copyright has proven itself as a better form of protection and we have seen successful companies being created using the copyright regime and more importantly uh, Code itself, software itself, is something which can be, you know, 
created and rewritten by different people in different ways. Uh, so it becomes very hard for us to uh, have protection over things because one of the things we mentioned about IP is the fact that it can be duplicated in the exactly the same way. So that is different for code because you can get the same functionality by writing, writing the code in a slightly different way. So that could, could be another reason why uh, software has not, patent protection has not been the main form of protecting software. Okay, gene editing technology like CRISPR-9, genome editing, whether they are patentable in India, contrary to one or Okay, again, if you look at the, the we, there is a guidelines on biotechnology, and they say that uh, uh, gene patents on modified genes will not be granted, but anything that is synthesized can be a subject matter or created artificially can be a subject matter of a patent. So tools are normally patented. Tools are granted patents. Editing tools are normally granted patents. And uh, uh, we do not know of this particular patent, whether, uh, whether it has been patented in India. Uh, we know so so we we would uh, we will have to look at the if if there is a particular patent number that you can share with us we can look into it and tell you whether it has been patented in india but the normal course is that the biotechnology guidelines that we have says that genes are, cannot be patented they are they are clear on that because it comes under 3J, it is treated as a plant or animal part. Okay, if uh, if there are more questions, then we will just... Okay, see, DNA, explain the startup. Okay, uh, the... Uh, DNA is treated as a part of a human, part of an animal. So 3J says that plants and animal in part, in whole or any part thereof, other than microorganisms. Now the countries which have actually granted gene patents actually say that the microorganism definition, genes behave like microorganisms and they have granted patents. But the Indian law clearly says that they cannot be patented. So DNA being a part of an animal is not something that can be patented. But there is still disagreement on this because artificially synthesized sequences, they would say that that is actually using existing uh, or, uh, existing um, what you call uh, things that occur in nature. And a, if a patent is created out of it, that could be subject matter of a patent. Uh, this is the uh, this is the norm in uh, jurisdictions like the United States, but we clearly say that a plant or animal parts cannot be subject matter of a patent. Uh, now, the startup initiative, uh, we can direct you to a video on startup. Uh, so, the startup initiation, uh, the rules have now been amended. The patent amendment rules 2017 has amended the uh, uh, the startup definition. There is no detail in the rules anymore. Now you'll have to go back to the startup initiative to know that a couple of things that got changed was earlier it had to be the five year period has now been extended to seven years so that's one change uh, and and for biotechnology it has been extended to 10 years so so we will be we'll be posting the video on the forum so there is a video that we have made uh, so you can you can you can just have watch the video so uh, we are now uh, close to 11 30 and we don't find any more questions uh, uh, please raise your questions in the forum. I've seen that some of you have been active in raising the questions. We will answer that. And if there is a special topic to be covered, I got some uh, feedback on covering certain things. So, so if you want any particular case study, like 
Monsanto and Bayer's acquisition of Monsanto, uh, Gilead and Yescarta. We'll have to look into it again, but I would need more detail from you as to what and, and DuPont and Dow chemicals, uh, Dow chemicals. So I would CRISPR-9. I would want a much more detail than what you have done. Please share that with us with uh, uh, either with Roshan or you can post a detailed statement. And, and if you tell me what you require, maybe we can take a smaller make a video on that or we can cover it up in the forthcoming seminars or forthcoming uh, live sessions. So, so we are going to close the session. Uh, we will stay uh, uh, in touch through the forum. And please let me know if there is something additional that needs to be done for you. Thank you so much.